So, you know, near the size of a, of a goose egg. Erica, be sure and let people in if you see them wanting to sure. come in. Okay, and then I'm gonna show you, we're gonna talk about the nest cup, which is a little bit of the nest that they make to hold the eggs. And if you can see here, it's hard to see, but they, they'll put feathers and, and mossy stuff in there uh, to make that nest cup so it's soft for the eagles. Uh, we're gonna talk about their feet. And uh, if you can see here, these are their talons. And if you look at my hand, you can't see it too well, but you can see their feet are pretty big. Uh, and then the skull, notice how large their eyes are in, in relation to the skull. Uh, the beak would be a little longer, but the first day that I used this skull, and it's not real, uh, and I had the beak pointed, painted yellow on a real skull, it wouldn't be yellow, uh, uh, a kid dropped it, so I lost part of the, part of the <laughs> beak, but, but I want you to look at the eyes in relation to the head, so that'll give you an idea when I talk about their eyes. Uh, so I think that's it for show and tell. So now I'm going to share my screen and uh, we'll get going. So let me just see how to do this. I should know this by now. I've done it a million times. So, uh, okay, just one second, slideshow. Okay, wait. Uh, Sorry, I got to do one more thing. I, uh, hold on, I can't. I'm sorry, I got to find me here. Okay. All right. Okay, I got to just minimize this because these boxes are all over the place. So, okay. So the eagles, I call them the comeback raptors, and you'll see why as we go along. But first, I want to talk about the eagle species in general beforehand because the eagle throughout all societies has always been you know, from a totem animal to a very significant uh, uh, wildlife species for all cultures. Uh, so it's not letting me change. Uh, hold on, it's not letting me advance. I don't know. There we go. Uh, anyway, there's perhaps no other bird in the history of mankind that has inspired gods and man than the eagle. Uh, philosophers like Aristotle and Pliny wrote about the eagles, as did Shakespeare. Many military leaders used the eagles as, as uh, their strength and their symbols as they went. And it's always been praised as a bird of prey of independent singularity. Uh, in ancient Greece and Rome, folks believed that the eagle or Aquila, which is uh, eagle in, uh, what, sorry, which is eagle in uh, Latin, was the king of the birds because it could ascend above the storm and become the messenger of gods. Whenever you see Zeus depicted, whether it's in a statue or uh, in pictures, he always will have the eagle by his side. Uh, the, all the, from Jupiter, the Romans, Odin, the tribes of Germania often would have the eagle on their helmets. So it's a very, very important talisman. Uh, in many cultures, even in the Bible, the eagles are mentioned many times. Here is one of the more well-known scriptures. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. And soaring like eagles is in many, many quotes, many poems, uh, you know, very important uh, image. Uh, Julius Caesar, whenever he went into battle, would not go into battle without the Aquila, the golden standard that signifies ferocity, strength, and power. Uh, you can see the standard on the top right. Uh, they would pick out a soldier to carry the standard, and if he was killed, somebody else would have to pick it up, uh, much like a battle flag, and then they would bear it onward. When Caesar's legions would come before him, before they went into battle, he would sanctify the golden eagle, which is generally the eagle that we're talking about in early times. Uh, I don't know why he thought he could sanctify things, but I guess he had a whole ceremony and that eagle that he used was gripping golden thunderbolts in the powerful talons and set to take flight against the enemies of Rome. Uh, eagles as symbols go way back to Babylonian times. Uh, Native American cultures have used eagles and part of the eagles they've used, they've merged into what you see on the top of many totem poles, which is a thunderbird. And that is uh, generally speaking, a combination of an eagle and sometimes a phoenix. Uh, the ancient philosopher Pliny said of the eagle that she beats its young ones while in an unfledged state with its wings 
and forces them from time to time to look steadily out of the nest upon the rays of the sun. And if she sees either of them wink or their eyes water, she will throw that eaglet out of the nest as being spurious and degenerate. While on the other hand, she'll rear the one whose gaze remains fixed and steady. So the eagle uh, is undaunting. Uh, it doesn't uh, let any other birds of prey worry it and probably not even humans too much. Uh, in many cultures, again, including the Aztecs and Native Americans, the eagle is said to represent the sun. And one flag that I find most interesting uh, after you look at these different crests, a lot of uh, armor would have these crests. A lot of time it was a double-headed eagle. Uh, so very, very important symbol throughout all, all uh, ages. Um, but our neighbor, Mexico to the south, has a, has a golden eagle on its flag. And um, that came from back during the Aztecian days. Uh, the Aztecs decided that they wanted to get a, uh, find a place uh, to put their capital. So in 1325, uh, long before most of North America was discovered, uh, they decided to uh, go until they found an eagle perched on a cactus. And when they did, that would be where they would create their city. Uh, the image did appear to them, but in an unlikely place. It was on a tiny island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. So to build the city, they had to form a number of small garden islands connected by causeways to get to it. The snake uh, was added later and now this is the site of Mexico City. And uh, you can see the olive branches uh, were added as well, denoting peace. Here's some other uh, cult flags. Uh, Austria, Poland for many, many centuries have had the eagle. And Sudan is one of the latest ones uh, that have the white-headed eagle, which is kind of a, uh, a very close kin to our bald-headed eagle. Uh, today, over 25 countries include eagles as symbols. Here's some of the newer ones. Again, you can see with Zambia in the top right, uh, this was adopted when the country won its in independence and their symbolism was that the eagle in flight symbolizes the freedom in Zambia and the ability to rise above the country's problems. Again, very, very powerful symbol. There are more than 60 species of eagles in the world today. Uh, eagles are large birds of prey. They're members of the bird family, Asipitridae. I don't pronounce Latin too well, even though I took five years of it. <laughs> so sorry about that. Uh, and uh, most of more than 60 species occur, occur in Eurasia and Africa. Our golden eagle is in North America and also in Asia and uh, other parts of the country. The Stellar's eagle up on the top left is the heaviest. It can weigh up to 20 pounds. Imagine that. It lives in Russia and it's actually a glacial remnant having developed during the Ice Age. You have a very powerful and beautiful raptor. The largest eagle in the Americas is the harpy eagle on the right there. Uh, it's in Central and South America. Uh, it's the largest in the Americas and it's up to 20 pounds with a nine foot wingspan, which is a foot longer than our largest bald eagle. Uh, its name refers to the harpies of Greek mythology, monsters in the form of a bird with a human face. Again, it does inhabit the rainforest of Central South America and is the national bird of Panama. It is an endangered species now, largely owing to the depletion of the rainforest. It's also now facing uh, a lot of stress because a lot of tourists now go there to see the harpy eagle. Uh, it does hunt during the daytime and this added uh, uh, population of people observing it are also contributing to its numbers dwindling. As I said, they hunt during the day, taking medium-sized mammals such as sloths and monkeys. The smallest eagle in the world is on your bottom left, the great Nicobar serpent eagle. It's from an island in India. It's, one, it's just under a pound and 16 inches in length. Compare this to the weight of our red-tailed hawk, which can be one and a half to three and a half pounds and 17 to 25 inches in length. As I say, obviously it is in size that makes an eagle an eagle. For, uh, here's some photos and whenever that we have illustrations in a bird book, they're not to scale as size, but it does give you a little, little picture of the different colorations of the different eagles throughout the world. Uh, they're very powerful raptors and they are very celebrated in many cultures. 
So if you're a, a fan of Harry Potter, if you read it to your kids or grandkids, the Harpy Eagle and the mythical Phoenix inspired the design of Fox the Phoenix in the Harry Potter series. Dumbledore's pet Phoenix that periodically burst into flames and you'll see the face, it looks kind of harpy like a Phoenix face didn't look exactly like that. Uh, so it shares the Phoenix uh, uh, Fox shares his name with the most infamous traitor in English history. His name's Guy Fox. And uh, it was a joke on the author's part because the Phoenix will periodically burst into flames. And Guy Fox, or Bonfire Night, is a huge celebration in England on November 5th that celebrates the Fiend's thwarted effort to blow up Parliament. So that's kind of how they, they got the name there and a little bit of literature for you library folks. So now we'll go to the Golden Eagle. Uh, I'll let you pronounce the Latin name in your head. It's like when I used to read uh, Russian novels and I read a lot of them, but they have some of those really long names. So I would just say Smith or Jones or whatever, you know, it made it easier. But anyway, in the US we have the Golden Eagle and the Bald Eagle. The bald eagle is only found in North America with its greatest concentrations in Alaska and Canada, while the golden eagle can be found not only here in North America, but also Europe, North Africa, and Asia. So not, not totally worldwide, but pretty widespread. It has a length of about three feet when it's perched. It can weigh up to 14 pounds and has a wingspan of uh, seven feet would be the largest. As predators, the golden eagle is a carnivore and it's the more ferocious of the two great birds. It preys on small mammals and has been known to attack livestock and small domestic animals such as dogs and cats. It's a solitary bird and prefers high mountains, mountainous areas and its range can be up to 165 miles. Now we have golden eagles sometimes in the winter, uh, generally birds of prey if it's really severe weather up north in Canada or further up they'll come down our way. Luckily, Connecticut is in the range. So we had a couple of golden eagles reported this year, interestingly enough, more towards the shoreline and one actually in Haddam. Generally, we see them up around Kent and in northwestern Connecticut. They're the fastest eagle in the world. They can fly up to 200 miles per hour when they're beating down on prey. There's only one bird of prey faster, and that's the peregrine falcon, which can dive at speeds of up to 245 miles an hour. Imagine a 12 to 14 pound uh, bird of prey coming down to, to attack something going those speeds. It's pretty amazing. Uh, I wanted to show you a difference. On the left is a golden eagle. On the right is what we call an immature bald eagle. Oftentimes, and sometimes these immature, oh. you'll, you'll see later, do have a lot of dark on them. Oftentimes uh, people mistake the immature bald eagles for a golden eagle, so we'll get you know sightings. But, I want you to look at the head and the tail on a golden eagle. And this is a, I mean, I'm sorry, on a bald eagle, this is a good way to distinguish them way high in the air. Their head and their tail stick out about the same distance from their wings. Whereas you see the golden eagle has kind of a short head. So even though if you measured it, it might not be totally equidistant, but that's a good identifier when you're trying to uh, see an eagle in the sky and tell what it is. Um, Here's uh, how the eagles change. So you can see at the top, uh, the first V1 would be a, what we call a juvenile bald eagle in its first year. Now those colors can be varied. Sometimes it'll have less white and you'll see later I have a bunch of examples. Uh, they don't really get their white head and tail till they're almost five years old. Uh, and uh, they also will have a yellow, uh, sorry, black beak and dark eyes until they're between three and four. Uh, the golden eagle, you can see as it changes when it's young, it has those white patches underneath, pretty easy to distinguish. And it's called a golden eagle because when it flies into the sun, the nape of its neck really appears golden. I was hiking on the Isle of Mull a few years ago in Scotland, and right at sunset, two golden eagles flew right across the sun. It was probably, might be one of my most magnificent, you know, live uh, viewings of wildlife. Uh, it was pretty spectacular. Um, so again, the so I told you two ways uh, you can pretty much tell them apart. Uh, here's the range of the bald eagle. Uh, the red is the breeding areas. Um, this this um, 
breeding would mean they're going to go there, they're going to breed, and then when, when they'll, they're done, they'll go elsewhere. But now, as you see, Connecticut's in the purple, which is year round. And we do have a year round population of bald eagles now. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And that means that they'll also breed here. So this map's a little confusing, but there are some bald eagles that will breed somewhere and then they go elsewhere in the non-breeding season. So eagles only migrate as far as they have to go to get food. So in Connecticut, um, we have usually open waterways somewhere all the time. So our bald eagles never really migrate very far, uh, but we will, we used to, the only population we used to have were from Northern eagles that would come down here in the winter time. Uh, and here, sorry, let me show you the, go the golden eagle. Um, you can see their distribution. So as you see, uh, we have no breeding eagles here. They do migrate here, uh, often mostly in the winter. Uh, they are year round out west. Uh, they do breed up in Alaska. So you can see quite interesting differences in, in those two uh, birds. So here's the bald eagle. I'll let you pronounce that. I won't try. Uh, yeah, it's our nation's symbol. It's the most singularly beautiful and magnificent bird and it's a member of the sea and fish eagle group. Since you're people who like libraries, I have to always throw in a few quotes and I love this one by Carl S Sandberg. There is an eagle in me that wants to soar, and there is a hippopotamus in me that wants to wallow in the mud. And isn't that, isn't that true? We all have projects and we think we're going to do them, uh, but then maybe we don't. But then all of a sudden we do and we can soar like an eagle. Uh, by the way, a bald eagle can soar to 10,000 feet. I've never seen one out of an airplane window, but I guess it's not impossible. And that, uh, so here's some more quotes about, again, how important the eagle was. Crazy Horse said, a great vision is needed and the man who has it must follow it as the eagle seeks the deep blue of the sky. And one of our most famous eagle quotes, and I can guarantee you that Neil Armstrong didn't write this. A bunch of suits were around the table for many, many meetings trying to think of what are we gonna say as soon as they touch down on the moon. So what they came up with Houston Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed. Now that's not to say that Armstrong might have said, hey, why don't we use the eagle or something, but we'll never really know. But generally speaking, it's a big committees of suited people, important people that come up with these terms. Uh, again, I love this. this. Longfellow Deed is known for writing the longest paragraph ever, even longer than William Faulkner's opening paragraph in The Bear. Uh, but anyway, and it was also the worst paragraph. It, so it's hard to soar the eagles when you're surrounded by turkeys. So you can Google almost anything these days. So I had to put this in here. Uh, and that brings us to Ben Franklin and the turkey. As most of you know, Ben Franklin was an erudite, sophisticated diplomat. He was a genius, a writer, an inventor, an author. But when it came down to it, he was a very practical man. After the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776, it next, next tasked Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson with designing a seal to represent the new country. Each man submitted a proposal, but their designs were awful, blandly allegorical, and pedantic. Um, on the left, you can see Franklin's proposal. He wanted to illustrate a scene from the exodus of the Israelites. The seal would show Moses parting the Red Sea with Pharaoh and his chariots being overwhelmed by the waters with the motto, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. Imagine that on a 50 cent piece. Uh, Thomas Jefferson though became so enamored with this motto, he put it on his own personal seal. Uh, then, uh, we have these descriptions were from John Adams' wife, Abigail. So that's how we learned them. Ad Adams on the right suggested an illustration depicting the choice of Hercules. This Greek allegory has Hercules deciding which path to walk in life by deliberating with the female personifications of pleasure and virtue. Again, imagine that as our symbol. Then on the left, Jefferson went back to the Bible he wanted an illustration of the Israelites' exodus out of slavery and bondage from Egypt for the front of his seal. Uh, so anyway, um, the Continental Des Congress decided, oh my gosh, these are just horrible. So the committee <laughs> failed and the Congress agreed in August 1776 to let the proposed designs lie on the table. There were two other committees that tried this and finally 
the Continental Congress said, we have to have a seal. We have to figure out who can do this seal. So they went to this man and Charles Thompson. He was the secretary of the Continental Congress for its entire 15 year existence. To create a design, they asked him to create a design. He used to be a doodler. I'm saying, well, I hope he wasn't doodling while they were you know, writing the constitution, but his reputation was such that whenever he uh, put a name on a report, they would say, here comes the truth. So I think we need a guy like him now, not just for designing our symbol. Uh, he was ranked closely to the president. Uh, so in the photo of the famous photo of signing the constitution, he stands to the right of John Hancock and Hancock and Thompson's are the only two names of the Dunlop broadside, which is the copy of the declaration printed the night of July 4th, the only version that was made public for the next uh, six months. Thompson's final design was approved by Congress in 1782. It was a combination of the elements provided by all three of the committees. That's his design in the top left. That was his sketch and how it looked on the right when the final design was first published in 1787 in the Columbian Magazine. And that brings us to the bald eagle, the symbol of the United States of America. When the founding fathers gathered at the Continental Congress uh, of 1782, it's no wonder they landed on the eagle as an emblem of America. It invoked both the supreme military and political power of the Roman Empire and the divine power of Christ. That was a quote from them. Uh, if you don't know what things on a seal mean, uh, this here it is. Uh, the eagle, obviously, again, was a symbol of strength and power, but his head was always turned to the olive branch, preferring peace, uh, clutching the national symbol. Uh, as you can see, the stars up top, there are 13. They represent the 13 colonies. There's 13 arrows also, 13 olive branches. Uh, uh, so all of these things, and in the escutcheon, there's 13 stripes. The red signifies hardness, valor. The white signifies purity. So next time you take out your wallet or blast Hotel California by the Eagles or catch up on Philadelphia Eagles and NFL football, think about just how far that symbolism has traveled before landing in your pocket, headphones, or televisions. So the reports that Franklin proposed the turkey as a national symbol began to circulate in American newspapers around the time of the country's sentinel and are based on a January 26, 1784 letter he wrote to his daughter in which he panned the eagle and extolled the virtues of the gobbler to his daughter, Sarah. He was in the order of Cincinnatus, which was a veteran group of Revolutionary War soldiers, and he was trying to get them to use the turkey as a symbol. So he said to his daughter, he said, for my own part, I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen as a representative of our country. He thought it was a bird of bad moral character that does not get its living honestly because it steals food from the fishing hawk and is too lazy to fish for himself. And it's not a native, original Native America, which is false. The bald eagle was a native bird of America. One of the things I like most about eagles is one of the things Ben Franklin detested, it's arrogance. If an eagle is beaming down on unsuspecting prey or has some prey in its talons, it will never look over its shoulders. Whereas other birds of prey always look over their shoulders to see if an eagle is attacking them. So, uh, now this is how we think the story about uh, Franklin wanting to propose the turkey to the Continental Congress as the symbol of the US. Uh, this in 1962, William Sean, who was the editor of the New Yorker, which is a magazine I've gotten since I was in junior high, I love it. Um, uh, he, they decided to have somebody illustrate what the turkey would look like as our symbol. So um, that letter, um, they put on there and uh, it became a story that people thought, oh, look, here's Franklin, here's the eagle. I mean, here's the turkey and Franklin's the one who wanted it to become a turkey. And now every school teacher just about teaches to all your children that Ben Franklin wanted the turkey for the US symbol, but we know better now. So I, <laughs> according to the US Diplomacy Center, this magazine cover did help popularize Franklin's preference for the turkey.
back in uh, colonial times when the colonists came to early America, they started clearing the land, which was over 90% forested at the time, and they started shooting anything they thought was a threat to their livestock or to themselves or to their food store sources. Uh, bald eagles are thought to have historically nested in all of the lower 48 states. It's estimated that at the time there were probably 50,000 breeding pairs of bald eagles, which is quite, quite a lot. Uh, but because of human activities, this population reached a low of 400 breeding pairs in the early 1960s. Uh, so a lot of that decline then was loss of habitat, shooting and trapping. Uh, then, as we'll go over soon, during the 50s and 60s, the use of pesticides, especially DDT, became a major, major problem. The DDT residues would accumulate in the fish that the eagle would eat. Uh, and these residues then accumulated in the eagles that ate the fish and caused a thinning of their eggshells. So when they sat on the eggshells, they wouldn't, uh, they would just break. Uh, so that plus lead shot and lead lures, which are a problem even today. So if you're a hunter, please switch to copper bullets because if an eagle goes to feed on a dead deer that has been dressed in the field, even if there's just a little drop of lead shot left in there, it can poison kill an eagle. Uh, this is true also of poisoning, rodenticides, please use snap traps, uh, don't use poison for mice and stuff. Uh, those are becoming, that and lead poisoning are becoming uh, the most lethal kill killers of a lot of our birds of prey. After World War II, they started crop dusting with this DDT. Uh, it killed uh, insects, uh, mosquitoes, all sorts of things. Where I grew up on a ranch in Texas, I remember seeing these crop dusters Obviously it was exciting for a kid to see, but we didn't even know, you know exactly what was going on and how it was really ruining the environment and a lot of wildlife species. Uh, so again, the residues would wash into water, waterways and plants and insects and fish absorbed it. And then birds of prey and other predators would eat it and they would all get poisoned. So this woman, and if you're in my age range, this was probably required reading when you were in junior high or high school. Uh, it's an allegory, Silent Spring. Uh, it's her allegorical novel that led to the banning of DDT, and it was a springboard for the environmental movement. Uh, it first was published in The New Yorker, and um, again, she started getting death threats because obviously, you know, big agriculture, they didn't want to get rid of their poison, uh, but um, she has been credited because of this single book as the founder uh, of, of the American environmental movement. And it did bring attention and led to the banning of DDT. And after that, it led to the creation of environmental organizations and uh, legislation. So uh, very, very important uh, book. I uh, encourage you to read it. Uh, so how are eagles doing today? Uh, there's eagles pretty much all the way all over the place. You can usually see them anytime here in Connecticut, and I'll tell you where and how later. Um, the bald eagle is truly a comeback raptor. Not many animals uh, of a large size ever escape distinction and come off of the endangered species list. Uh, only a handful of large species have fought their way back from this list, and that's the bald eagle, the American alligator, and the California gray whale. This is a beautiful eagle that I got pictures of in, on a very windy lake in New Hampshire. And for some reason, it just decided to sit there and let me take photos. So I was very happy with that. I don't have great lenses, but I was pretty close. So <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't really paddle away very easily because the wind was so fierce. Uh, the bald eagle's recovery is perhaps the best known example of how our environmental laws work to restore not just a resource, but our national symbol. Uh, so here's a, a chart. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of charts aren't updated that often by biologists. I think it's because they are so busy in the field that they don't get time to sit down at their computer and do stuff. So, so anyway, by, you can see in 1963, a very, very small number of nesting pairs. And we, the population is kind of gauged by how many nesting pairs you have. And then you uh, add in how many average of young eaglets they have, and then you kind of can come at numbers. So the largest population of bald eagles is in Alaska with an estimation of around 30,000 birds. 
uh, if you go to Sitka, Alaska, the ball, there's so many bald eagles there, they're like pigeons in Central Park, so very healthy up there. In the lower 48 states, Minnesota and Florida follow in numbers of nesting bald eagles. Um, so now we think we are back up to about um, somewhere between 20,000 nesting pairs in the lower 48, which is really just a remarkable, remarkable comeback. So in, here's what we do every year on the second Saturday of January, and you can become involved if you want. You can go on the DEEP website and uh, Google bald eagles, and you'll find that you could sign up for the midwinter eagle survey. And really all you have to do is you'll be, you'll be signed a couple of miles uh, in wherever your area. And from seven in the morning till 11, you'll go up and down this area and write down any species of birds of prey you see, or uh, if you see eagles, you have to record the wind and the temperature and stuff like that. So it's a way you can be kind of like a citizen scientist. Don't have the numbers from this year yet, but last year was a high. We, there were 181 eagles observed. Some of those obviously are our resident eagles and others will be Northern eagles. So the scientists will take this number and mix it with all kinds of other sightings to come up with an estimated population. But this also is a national survey and helps us get a sense of um, eagle movement and numbers. Uh, in Connecticut, this is a great story. Uh, in 1992, the, we had one, the first nesting pair that had been observed uh, since records were kept. It was here on the reservoirs in Bark Hampstead, Connecticut, one nesting pair. And now you can see in 2020, uh, we had uh, 72 active territories. So that means there were, there were 72 pairs trying to create nests. 47 of them uh, ended up having successful nests and they produced 88 chicks. And uh, this is just pretty remarkable growth. I mean, some people say, well, wow, that was all the way in 1992. Doesn't seem like a lot of growth to me, but Trust me, in, in, in a wildlife species, there's so many things they face and so many ways that, you know, they die uh, that, that this is a remarkable growth and we should be very proud of it and do all we can to make sure that all the protections for these birds are, are kept in place. Um, again, this is an older map, but you can kind of look. Uh, you obviously see um, Litchfield has nesting areas, Warren, uh, Kent. So, uh, we do have quite a few nesting areas. A lot of the, a lot of the nests, like the ones here in Bark Hampstead are on MDC property. So, you know, you can't go there, which is probably better off for the health of the eagles. Although a lot of our wildlife species, and I know I've told you this before, have become ex-urban, which means they tolerate a cert, certain amount of urbanization. So we, we have uh, an eagle's nest uh, where you can see it from a shopping center in Hamden. Uh, in New Haven, eagles made a nest in a cemetery. I said, well, at least they have quiet residents. But uh, so uh, there are eagles in places where you can see them now. But if you see their nest, we ask you to please stay at least 300 yards away, you know, because they, they will tolerate a certain amount. But during nesting time, particularly when they're sitting on the eggs, uh, it's very vital to try to protect them. So here we are, here's eagles in Connecticut uh, in the 50s, no nesting eagles. Uh, they were endangered in Connecticut in 92. Uh, we had our first nesting pair uh, in Bark Hampstead in 92, as I said. In 2010, we ground graded to threatened in Connecticut. In 2018, again, uh, I gave you the other two, I have to update that. So I showed you the 2020. So um, here's nationally, uh, you can see the numbers there. Uh, in 1940, noting that the bald eagles were threatened with extinction, Congress passed the Bald Eagle Protection Act, which prohibited the killing, selling, or possessing a species. In 1962, they amended that and added the Golden Eagle, and it became the Bald Eagle and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Uh, so all of these things have led to other um, protections. So uh, there's numerous laws. The Lacey Act was pretty much enacted when uh, people were shooting all kinds of birds for feathers, imagine that, and using other parts for other reasons. Uh, uh, so that act protected that. And as each of these acts were enacted, uh, fines also were uh, added. 
The Migratory Bird Treaty Act was a precursor to the Bald Eagle Protection Act. It's a federal law that carries out the U.S. commitment to the violation of any state, tribal, or U.S. law. It prohibits false records, false labels, or identification of wildlife shipped. I mean, there's just a bunch of things that it protects, but it, but it did protect uh, things that are still going on today where people are capturing birds like finches and shipping them all over the world and killing them. So uh, this, this stopped all that and has helped preserve a lot of our uh, birds of prey. So dangers to eagles and other birds face. Uh, we know we have some wind farms in Connecticut. Uh, they're actually slaughtering millions of birds and bats annually. Uh, but the wind turbine companies were given a 30 year exemption from federal government if they killed eagles uh, inadvertently. Uh, but now environmentalists are working and the government uh, with uh, these wind turbine com companies to try to get them to figure out ways to make it where the birds don't fly into these turbines. Uh, green energy, as we know, is very commendable. We all support it, but we need modifications to made it made in these uh, wind turbines and where they're placed to ca counteract the deaths of these uh, birds. A lot of electric companies are now working to put things uh, to protect the eagles. Um, if a bald eagle or, or a bird of prey is perched upon a high voltage power pole, they may inadvertently touch the power source with one foot and the ground at the same time. When this happens, the bird is killed instantly. Uh, they may also fly directly into power lines in poor weather conditions. So uh, electric companies have been working with them to place these triangles up there to help uh, keep the um, birds from perching up there. How long can they live for a large bird with no natural predators? The mortality or death rate of the bald eagle is quite high. Up to 75% of the juveniles in their first year die. Uh, a lot of times uh, they don't learn to feed themselves well. When they fledge, they might fall to the ground and die. Uh, they might be eating more carrion uh, or dead stuff on the roads than the adults would and they get hit by cars. Uh, but once the eagles make it into their second, going into their second year, they have a much better rate of survival. Um, they can live to uh, 20, 20 years, maybe 30 in the wild. Wow. Uh, the oldest wild banded eagle on record in the United States uh, was an alumnus of a conservation program in New York State that brought young eagles there to try to get the, boost the population. Uh, at just a few weeks old, the bird on the right, 03142, was taken from his Minnesota home and taken to New York's Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge, along with some eaglets from other states. The bio biologists hoped that these young ones would stick around their new home and fledge, and many of them did. A few years later, the male half of this particular nest uh, died, and 03142, which is now on, in that nest on the right, took his place in this old nest at Hemlock Lake. Over the next few decades, he fathered many young eaglets doing his part to push his species there out of danger. Um, but he was probably, they think he was there in 1989 when uh, the recovery program ended. And uh, in 2007, when bald eagles were taken off the federal endangered species list. But unfortunately, when he was 38 years old, uh, he was eating a rabbit on a road in New York and he was hit by a car because he had a band on him. They could tell that he was 38 years old wow. and at the time he was less than 20 miles from this nest. So they think that Eagle 03142 uh, used that nest for, you know, his whole life there. And he may or may have had the same mate. They do mate for life, but if they lose a partner, they'll find another net mate. And they do use the same nests unless something happens to take the nest down. Here's the talon of him. Uh, they think that he was, because he was so old, he probably was eating more dead stuff off the road and probably didn't have the reflexes or the ability to get it, you know, get out of the way in time. So sad, but it did give us a chance to see that, oh my gosh, this eagle lived to be 38 years old in the wild, which is pretty incredible for any wild animal. Uh, so again, it's a big bird. Uh, Bald eagles exhibit what's called reverse sexual dimorphism, which means the female is larger than the male. 
uh, and it's considerably larger, but it's almost impossible to tell which is the male and which is the female unless they're perched side by side. Uh, the primary fe feathers do offer an identifying difference if you can get close enough. However, uh, if you see again here side by side, you can see even though the, the branch is at an angle, you can see the one on the right is much larger. I was able to get a shot of these birds in Litchfield. Um, and here I want to show you, if you see the primary feathers, which are the dark feathers, this is an eagle I shot on the Farmington River a couple of weeks ago. That's a sycamore tree with their little balls there. Uh, on the male eagle, these primary feathers will extend over their white tail when they're perched in a tree. So you can kind of see this. So if you can see them perching and you can see their tail and there's no other eagle there, that's a way you can also tell the male from the female. Uh, being slightly smaller, the male is uh, more agile and he has an advantage in catching prey. So oftentimes once the eggs uh, are hatched, the, the adult male will do more of the fishing, even though they do switch off during incubation and also when the eaglets are hatched because with their big wings, they have to have a chance to get out of the nest and you know stretch those wings and dry off a little sometimes. But being larger, the female is better able to incubate the eggs and brood the young chicks. Uh, she can use her body to shelter these eaglets from the cold soaking range or hot sun. As you know, here in Connecticut, even though we're having a beautiful weekend, you know, it's not unlikely that all of a sudden we're going to have one of those uh, late March, early April snowstorms followed by huge winds and rains. And that's about the time that our bald eagles will be hatching our, uh, their young. So a very critical time. Uh, and we have lost uh, uh, eaglets uh, that way. Um, Northern eagles can be up to seven inches taller than southern eagles. That's true of a lot of animal species. Black bears in the in north are much bigger than the southern black bears. Uh, and uh, male northern eagles are slightly larger than southern females. There's a scientific reason for this, and I always like to bring this up because in every crowd there's some people who like science. It's called the Bergman's rule, B-E-R-G-M-A-N-N. -N. It means body size is large in cold climates and small in warm climates. Uh, large bodies have a smaller surface area to volume ratios. So in cold climates where you need to retain heat, bodies are larger and more compact. In warm climates where you need to expel heat, bodies are smaller and more linear. So you can look that up if you want to know more about it. It does apply in other species too. So. A bald eagle has 7,200 feathers, pretty incredible, huh? And they're hollow and make up about seven to 10% of its weight. 30% of those are on, are on their head. So when you see some more shots I have of head shots, um, you'll be able to see very fluffy on their head. Uh, their bones are also hollow. They take up about five to 6% of the body weight compared to the bones of humans, which take up 20%. I always joke with my friends when they're on their perpetual diets if there's 20%, you can't lose it's bones. And then how much water weight do we have? So anyway, if you look at this picture, I was able to get a bald eagle from underneath. And you can see those uh, primary feathers. They use those little fingers for, uh, you know, uh, soaring and turning a little bit. Um, here you can see uh, they provide the thrust with the primaries. The secondaries underneath provide lift, like on a plane. You can just kind of see that. And the retresses provide braking and do help with steering, as do the primaries. I was able to get this photo a few weeks ago. I was happy to get it because even though I don't have a great lens, I'm pretty good at shooting moving birds. So I was able to, you can see how this bird is turning there and you can see how they use those wings. Uh, and you can also kind of see just the scope of how big they are. Here's another shot, a good shot of their primaries. Uh, very important. And this, I want to tell you, uh, a friend of mine up here took these photos. She goes out early every morning and follows this pair. Uh, here they are taking flight. One thing if you're watching and photographing them, not to be gross, but a lot of times before a perched eagle takes off, it'll, it'll poop. So if you see them do that, then you can be pretty sure it's a pretty high percentage they're going to start taking off. So here you see them getting ready to take off. This bird doesn't really have any branches in the way, so it had a pretty free access to leaving. Uh, in this photo I took, this bird was in like a, a hardwood tree and had a lot of branches. So for them to be able to get those big wings clear of all those branches, they have to kind of do a free fall 
until they get out of the way of the branches and then they'll spread out their wings. When you're watching birds of prey up above, uh, a lot of people have trouble distinguishing a vulture from a bald eagle or even a red-tailed hawk, which I can't even imagine because they even, they're just different shaped and smaller. Uh, but this is the typical profile of a bald eagle when it's soaring, it's called planking. So kind of like a two by four, the wings will be out like this. Uh, and uh, I was happy to be able to get a photo like this just to illustrate that. Uh, so when you're watching uh, a bunch of these large birds and they seem to be going in a circle and they keep going up, up and up, that's called a kettle of eagles or a kettle of vultures. Think about the steam coming out of a tea kettle, you know, it's a thermal of hot air and they just catch these thermals and they're able to go up, up and up. It's pretty fascinating. Now, a vulture, turkey vultures and black vultures, when they fly, they look very large. A lot of people think they're eagles, but they're not anywhere near the size. But they also, their wings will be in a V shape and they kind of rock, you know what I mean? Whereas a, a, an eagle is kind of like those Mercedes ads where you put the glass of champagne on the top of the car and it doesn't spill. They're very steady when they fly. So I always laugh when, whenever there's something on Facebook and somebody says, oh, I saw a, a fisher cat, which we know it's not fisher cat, it's fisher. They're in a weasel family. Or we saw this or that. And, or I heard this scream in the night and I know it was a fisher cat. Well, if you Google, you know, fisher cat, like the top hundred things come up and you hear this scream and everybody says it's a fisher cat, which is a fisher, but it never is. It's always a fox. So everybody always seems to be an expert, a wildlife expert. But meanwhile, these people have no idea. They're just listening to what they heard. And the reason I went off chart and said that is that we all know John James Audubon, the famous ornithologist and artist. And apparently he was a pretty pompous guy, but he had heard that there was a, a, a great new eagle on the Mississippi River. So in 1814, he hired a guy to take him up the river because he wanted to discover it. He saw this huge eagle. He called it the mightiest of the feathered tribe. And he was so excited that he discovered a new bird of prey. He named it the Washington Sea Eagle. I'm surprised he didn't call it the Audubon Sea Eagle. But anyway, the other ornithologists that were in the area all heard about this and they were in the area because they heard, had heard about the bird already. So they all went to the river the next day and much to their delight, found out it was immature bald eagle. It wasn't a new eagle at all. But John James Audubon painted it anyway. So I'm going to now tell you about the differences in the changes that, that the uh, bald eagle undertakes as it grows up. On the left, you have what we call a juvenile bald eagle. That would be in its first year after it's fledged. Fledged means it's leaving, left the nest. You see it has dark eyes, uh, dark beak. Uh, on the top right is an eagle that's between three and four. So you can see now the eyes are getting a little lighter colored. Uh, the, the beak is getting a little more uh, yellow. And bottom right, uh, there's an adult bald eagle, but not quite probably. It's probably somewhere between four and a half and five years old because you see it still has smudging on their head. Now, some of them will always retain a certain amount of smudging, but generally speaking, uh, it gets pretty white. Uh, here's a comparison. So you can kind of see this one on the right has a lot less white underneath than how somebody might say, oh, I saw a golden eagle. But again, look at the heads. Now, uh, generally uh, by nine weeks, uh, a young eagle is full size, except for the wings have to get a little more muscles when they fly. But again, identifying markers are the head and tail are pretty much equidistant from the wings. Uh, here's a first year plumage fledgling. Uh, again, this one's quite dark. Sometimes they'll have more, uh, sometimes they'll have more white on them. So they all vary a lot. But if you see something really, really large, I mean, we don't have, this is the largest bird we'll have flying, not counting herons or something, but you know, flying high in the sky. Um, so here's uh, two, um, uh, these were, I'm sorry, juveniles, they had just left the nest. So you can see they're a little different. There's one's got a lot of white down the middle. Somebody could maybe mistake that for an osprey, but I'll show you why not a little later. But again, you see there's a large variation. Uh, here's second year plumage. Uh, this photo is by Paul Fusco, who's the DEP photographer. Uh, he's got a great job, gets to go out and take all kinds of great photos on properties that most of us can't go on. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 
So you can see the brown, you see the dark beak and the dark eyes still, still. And this one has a lot of white modeling. Uh, there, this one's a lot, you know, a lot more white. Uh, so uh, they do vary a lot. Uh, this is third year plumage. Uh, here's one that's like, again, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, what is that bird you're gonna say? Because you would have probably never seen a bird like this, but still note the dark beak and the, the dark eyes. So this is still like uh, between a three and four year old bird. Uh, so here they are, the fourth year plumage. You can see that the, the tail feathers are starting to get, get white. Uh, the uh, head is starting to get white. Uh, and again, here's what we call, so after, so after their first year, we start to call them immature. So from their second to their fourth year, we call them immature bald eagles. From the fourth to fifth year, they're called subadults. And this one right here is a subadult. Uh, so it's not got quite the change on its beak and eyes, but again, there you can see another one, just they're all different, uh, but obviously the one on the right's a female. Uh, and here they are, spectacular. Again, this is a male. Remember I told you those primary feathers will lap over the, the white tail feathers. So that's another way you can tell if they're by themselves. Uh, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the osprey and the bald eagle. Uh, the head comparison here is a little off because osprey is much smaller uh, than the bald eagle, but um, you know, it's just a good uh, way for you to see their eyes. Uh, look at the difference in their beaks are quite different. Um, and, but I wanna tell you, because they're both sea eagles and they both hunt in the same places. And uh, so it's important to know the difference and the difference in, in how they act. Um, the osprey, uh, again, they sometimes are, we call the osprey the St. Patrick's Day bird because it does migrate, but it usually comes back around St. Patrick's Day and it will go to man-made platforms and other nests and start building their nests again. Uh, the ospreys do exhibit some similarities to juvenile bald eagles, such as they have brownish fur with white mottling, a dark build, you see, uh, but they do always have the yellowish eyes. Uh, but there are key differences in the shape of their bills. Uh, the bald eagle's beak is more curved and larger and sharper compared to osprey bills. Ospreys do have a laundry list, though, of adaptations absent in hawks that feed on terrestrial prey. The osprey, I got to take a drink of uh, water. Hold on, please. The osprey is a plunge diver exclusively. Most people think it dives head first. It does not. It dives feet first, but it does go underwater, unlike the bald eagle. So it'll plunge down, go underwater. And generally, about 70% of the time, it catches something, whereas the bald eagle is under 50%, mostly because the bald eagle snatches fish or, or ducks or whatever out of the water, but they don't go under the water. But once they extend those long legs out, they can't see their prey anymore. So uh, it's catch as catch can. So, uh, so that's why the first way that eagles get their food is by dead stuff on the road, which can be a hazard but they don't have to expend any energy. The second way is they steal from other birds, usually osprey. So when, whenever the osprey come back, oftentimes the eagle will sit near their nest and wait till they fly off to fish. And as soon as the osprey fishes, the eagle will harangue it until it drops its uh, prey. Uh, so uh, another thing about ospreys is uh, the soles of their feet have tiny sharp tubercules that are rubber-like that create a non-slip surface for gripping the fish. So, you know, they're not as big as a bald eagle, so it's a little harder for them to hold, you know, a larger uh, fish. Bald eagles can only hold four pounds, so if they do kill a duck or some other, other bird like that, they'll have to swim it to shore. They can swim. They use their arms kind of like doing the butterfly, but it's very dangerous. If the water's cold, they can get hypothermia. But if they do get their prey to shore, they'll kind of shred it apart and take pieces of it and eat there and then take other pieces up to a, to a limb. Um, so the osprey also has unusually dense, thick, oily feathers and longer legs. Um, Though clearly smaller with a black stripe always across the eye, so it's like a mask. Uh, it's like a superhero mask there. Uh, that's the clear giveaway. 
they still are mistaken from a distance. The bald eagle, though, is much larger, as I said, eight to 14 pounds versus the osprey with an average of two to four and a half pounds. So quite a huge difference. Uh, but, you know, still, if you see a four and a half pound bird, you know, with like a four foot wingspan or five foot, it looks pretty big in the sky to you. So here they are. Here you can see the osprey. It's going feet first, then it's going to plunge in. And the eagle has those long legs sticking out. Um, one thing that makes them successful in a certain area is they do hunt in a certain territory. And so they get to <clears throat> specialize in particular prey there. So if you're on the west branch of the Farmington River or part of the Housatonic, maybe you're looking for trout. So they get a sense of where these uh, fish are and they develop what's called a set. And so the more often they find a particular food, the better they are at finding it. It allows them to pick out prey against the confusion of their surroundings. And this is true of owls when they hunt at night. They typically hunt in the same area, so they kind of know where things are and it helps them out. So I like to throw this in, kleptoparasite. So that's what the bald eagle is. He steals from other birds. So it's the term for an animal that steals a meal from another animal. It's a form of hunting that's quite common and it does occur in nature from mollusks to mammals and at least 197 species of birds. So I guess Ben Franklin, even though he wasn't going for it for the national symbol, he might have been right about the character. Uh, the osprey again is good at fishing and you see the eagle, he's got a, the osprey has a little, looks like a little perch in his uh, talons and here comes the eagle. Uh, but uh, sometimes the eagle will grab the uh, fish right in the air, but sometimes they lose it all together. And let me show you this, what happened to me. I was driving on a road in Simsbury. I looked on the, it was a very narrow road and there was a bald eagle swooping down to the road. And I'm like, what the heck? And then I saw a red-tailed hawk. So the red-tailed hawk had a squirrel. And so the red-tailed hawk flew off of the squirrel Poor squirrel dropped down to the ground, but the eagle kept after the hawk. I jumped out of the car. I probably left my car in the middle of the lane and tried to get whatever photos I could. I noticed the squirrel ran off, but the eagle kept haranguing this red-tailed hawk. So I was happy to get the picture, but neither of them got the squirrel. <laughs> so here's the osprey. Those eyes, you can tell those eyes are looking right at, you know, it's going down to the water to get something. My friend Cheryl got this photo. This is right when it entered the water. Spectacular shot. And you can see the wing right in the foreground there. So the bird goes under and here it comes up. So it's coming up and isn't it beautiful? There's a beautiful identifier of what they, uh, the osprey look like. Just a fabulous photo. Cheryl's a great photographer, has great lenses too, but she's a wonderful photographer. Uh, good photography takes a lot of patience, waiting you know, for the right time. Uh, and she's very good at that. You can see this uh, fish. Uh, I'm not a fish person, but might be a trout. I don't know. And uh, he's probably looking for the eagle, you know, making sure nothing comes to take it away. So I got this one. I was happy to get this one, but <laughs> I was in my kayak and you can tell this eagle saying, you're not going to get my fish. So uh, anyway, uh, this is another eagle I got on the Farmington River. Uh, again, he's kind of hidden in the uh, you know, into the branches, but looking down at the river. So eyesight, all eagles are renowned for their excellent eyesight, thus the term eagle-eyed. Eagles, like all birds, have color vision. An eagle's eye is, uh, is, more, is larger than a grown man's, even though the eagle's weight is roughly 1 20th of a human being. Its sharpness is at least four times that of a person with perfect vision. An eagle can identify a rabbit moving almost a mile away. So that means if, if they're flying at an altitude of a thousand feet over open country, they could spot prey over an area of almost three square miles from a fixed position. Superman move over, I say. Eagles do hunt by eyesight. Their eyes, though, are stationary, so they have to move their head to see objects. They have 3D vision, same as binocular vision, which means that both eyes focus on an object at the same time. And this is a requirement for a fast hunter that has to gauge distance to a potential meal. They also have what's called a nicotating membrane, which is a third mm -hmm. eyelid. It's this opaque material that can cover their eyes and keep debris out. Um, so it's a very good protection uh, 
Other animals like bobcats have this as well. Beavers have it. Uh, here's a picture of, you can tell the eagle's uh, beaks that are made out of uh, keratin like our fingernails. They do wear, you know, when they're eating into stuff. So, uh, but this is just a look of uh, how they're, how well their head is suited for survival. Uh, feet or talons are the business end of eagles. They have four toes. The rear toe or the hallux is like our big toe. Their talons are made out of keratin, same as our nails, and they can grow up to two inches long. When an eagle is in captivity because it can't, it can no longer fly and is being used for educational purposes, there's a procedure called copying, coping. They have to cut those nails. It's a pretty, pretty hard thing to do, but they do have to do it. I think it's hard for doing your own dogs. Imagine an eagle. <laughs> but anyway, the eagle has a mechanism in its talons that allows the talons to lock while it's sitting on a branch. Haven't you always wondered how a bird of prey sits on a branch and doesn't just uh, rotate around when it's sleeping? Well, that's how. <laughs> so what do eagles need to survive? Here you see this eagle going after an immature bald eagle trying to take its food. They need food, nests, roosts, privacy, and a healthy environment. 90% uh, of their diet is fish. Again, I told you they obtain food in three ways. Carry on a dead stuff would be the first way. Steal it from other birds and they hunt. During the winter, they perch 90% of the time. Uh, if they feed one day, they can skip a day if they have to. Uh, on average, they need to eat a pound and a half of food per day with a minimum of half a pound, although they can keep stuff stored in their crop. So they might eat more in one day if the, if the weather's severe. Uh, they fly at about an average speed of 30 to 35 miles per hour. So once they get off that branch, you better be ready if you wanna get their photo because they get up to 35 pretty quickly. Uh, they can only dive at a rate of 50 miles per hour because they're pretty, pretty darn big. Um, so again, as I said, it can swim. Their hunting area can vary from 1,700 acres to 10,000. Uh, but their territories are generally about two miles when they're nesting. They will eat smaller uh, mammals. Uh, very unlikely they'd ever take your dog or cat, uh, too heavy usually, uh, and it's not the environment they'd probably be in unless you're right on the river or something. Um, but again, uh, so here's, here's a eagle I got, and it had this little thing on its beak. I have no idea what that is, but it stayed there. So it just must be some white, it just must have turned white. But uh, there's no secret that the survival and recovery of all eagles was and is dependent on clean water and the availability of healthy fish and other aquatic life. Uh, so this is a key reason why a lot of organizations that protect our waterways, nonprofits and other entities uh, are very important because they help keep these waterways clean and safe, not only for flora and fauna, but also for the use of us and the health of our population. Uh, here again, you can see the seagulls looking for something uh, to catch. Uh, and here they are eating dead stuff. Uh, you will see this. Um, and unfortunately, some mortalities uh, when they are on the sides of roads. Um, so they are scavengers. Again, my friend Cheryl got this photo one day of that's a possum over there on the other side of the crow. And generally speaking, bald eagles are fairly gregarious when they're roosting together, but if it's over prey, they might get a little aggressive. So this bald eagle came in and wanted to have part of that frozen possum. Uh, it was mostly gone though. Here's a bald eagle going at a red-tailed hawk to try to get something from it. So they will, they do, they are robbers, they are pirates. Uh, again, when they roost together, their habitats are around lakes, marshes, rivers, seacoasts, uh, bordered by tall trees. Uh, with not too many obstructions. Uh, they might go 12 miles away from a feeding area to a perfect roost, and a roost will have a lot of branches that protect them in the cold like this one. Uh, and, and again, this is a, they are not antagonistic towards each other when they're roosting, and roosting is when they're sleeping at night. Uh, so here again, there's no food they're worrying about, so they all are just hanging out. You know, they're not all related, but they all just think that's a good perch, so. <laughs> So the life cycle of eagles, uh, traditionally they have chosen remote areas for nesting, as I said, used to prefer white pines and other tall trees with a canopy over the top. If they lose the canopy, 
particularly in our environment, they might have to move on to another nest because they don't have protection from the winter elements. Now out in Florida and out west, sometimes there will be uh, bald eagle nests without these canopies. Uh, and again, as our population has grown in Connecticut, we're experiencing birds that set up nests in urban and suburban settings as well. Uh, they are just becoming much more tolerant of civilization, which may not be a good thing. So in January and February, the eagles get together here in Connecticut and they start bringing more materials to their nest. And the way the nest gets bigger each year is they keep bringing branches and other material. Uh, they're prodigious architects when it comes to their nests. Uh, so here they are carrying sticks. Uh, this would be material for like the nesting cup I told you about. Uh, their nests are called Aries. Uh, again, as I said, they mate for life. Uh, so here's the nesting season in Connecticut. Uh, as we're seeing with climate change, some things are changing a little bit, but right now this is still pretty accurate by now. Most of our eagles have probably laid their eggs and they're sitting on them now uh, because, you know, during the time they lay them, which would be the end of February into mid-March, uh, we didn't have a lot of terrible weather. We had a lot of wind. Uh, those nests on average are 10 to 100 feet off the ground uh, and they can be, you know, on an average, they're about six feet high. I, I mean, sorry, six feet across and they get deeper every year. Uh, they'll use sticks and twigs up to three inches in diameter. They do prefer more green sticks. So I've seen eagles bouncing up and down in the winter on a branch until it breaks and then they'll take it. They line the nest with pine needles, grass, evergreen, oftentimes even, uh, even feathers. Uh, they do have, they're very meticulous about keeping a clean nest. Uh, they will not soil their nest. It's kind of like your dog's not supposed to soil in their crate. So you will see them poop off the side of the nest. And um, so this is the largest nest on record. Uh, it was 10 feet across and 25 feet deep and weighed 4,400 pounds. Uh, so it's pretty big. This is in St. Petersburg, Florida. It no longer, uh, whoops, sorry. It no longer exists. It finally fell down. It finally got too heavy. I don't even know how they weigh a nest, but presumably they had some way of, me you know, measuring, <laughs> you know, how much it weighed. But imagine that over two tons. This is a nest out west that fell, and they just put those fake sycamore limbs up there just to kind of illustrate what would be holding the nest up. But you can see how they kind of weave things around. Here are both adults in a nesting tree. Uh, one individual's in the nest, uh, and it would, but at this point, this was in February, it would still be a few weeks before early February they laid eggs. Uh, when you see a nest, if you see just a, if you see a bird sticking up this high and only one in the nest, then there aren't eggs there yet because once they're sitting on the eggs, you'll just see the top of the white head because they have that nest cup they'll be sitting in. Um, so again, they are monogamous uh, and they'll only change partners if one dies or they are unsuccessful at producing chicks. Um, after the eaglets have grown to full size and fledged, the, the adults will be on their own separate ways until the next winter. Uh, none hang out at the nest until it's, time, until it's time to start adding materials for the new nesting se season. Not to anthropomorphize, but this kind of looks like a, a great Valentine shot when they're starting to get think about mating, but it's just depth of field. So uh, again, here, look at those branches around that nest. Um, this was still prior to them laying eggs. Uh, there are the two of them are just sitting there, you know, they've been doing their work, so they're just hanging out. This was taken uh, in March 2018. Uh, the eagles have a lot to deal with around here with the elements, uh, particularly when the chicks are born. At this point, there were nests and the eggs, but no chicks. When eagles mate, this is their beautiful dance. Uh, it's, it's known uh, when it comes to courtship, the bald eagles put the wild in wildlife. This maneuver is called the Cartwell display or the death spiral. They are not mating during this maneuver, but it's a courtship rit ritual. They soar up very high. They'll lock talons and then start tumble and court willing towards the earth. They do let go before reaching the ground, except when they don't. In 2014, two adult eagles talons locked 
and were found tangled in a tree in Portland, Oregon. Eventually, they broke free and flew off. Again, in Connecticut, January, early February is mating season and time to get the rest nest ready for eggs. Uh, here again, my friend Cheryl, you can see now this, this female on the left is a full adult and she has retained some dark feathers in her tail. So again, every once in a while that'll happen, but mostly they're going to be pure white like the male on the right. So that one is easy to identify because she has those black. So I got this, don't be crude, but this is a eagle's mating. So I did see that. Uh, so here's reproduction cycles. Uh, they lay their eggs five to 10 days after they mate. Uh, they'll lay them one at a time over usually a 48 hour period. Um, about three eggs is average for Connecticut. You know, it's all kind of a guess because, you know, until the biologists get up there, they don't know exactly how many eggs are there. Uh, incubation is 34 to 36 days. Uh, approximately 120 days elapsed from the start of the egg laying process until the eaglets are fledged. Uh, again, both uh, eagles will share incubation, although the female is uh, on the eggs longer. Uh, freezing will kill an embryo and they can freeze within sec you know 10 seconds in in really severe weather uh, this is a very interesting thing about eagles a brood patch that bare spot you see is an area on the parent's chest that does not have feathers uh, this is the area that touches the eggs while the parent's incubating them and allows for a more efficient transfer of heat uh, not all birds develop a brood patch uh, in species of bald eagle, both parents can, but generally it is the female. Uh, as it develops uh, and she uh, lays her eggs, that leaves this patch of bare skin and the blood vessels fill with warm blood. So when you see the female wiggle or settle upon the eggs, they're spreading that bare patch over the eggs to keep them warmer. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty incredible. Approximately 35 days again are required for the embryo to develop into eggs. The eggs are laid here in late February to, uh, I'm sorry, in um, late March. They're usually one to three dull white eggs in a clutch. Um, so when the little eaglets want to get out, they have this thing called an egg tooth. You can see the little white part on that eaglet there, that's an egg tooth. And then you can see in that egg on the left, a little white thing. So during the process of hatching, the chick employs this egg tooth. It's a pointed chisel-like structure on the tip of the beak that is designed for cracking the shell. Here they are when they're first born. Uh, they're three to four ounces. Uh, they can't lift their heads for two days. They're what we call a cypridal, which means they're totally dependent on their parents. Uh, you can see those little egg tooths there. They'll eventually you know, go away. Uh, they grow at a rate of one to pound a, a week. I guess parents are glad that, uh, <laughs> that your kids didn't. Uh, so the adults tend to feed the, the firstborn first. And so the others have to kind of fight to get whatever little morsels they can. The, uh, fish, the uh, eagles will uh, tear the fish into small strips and offer them to the chicks. And the chicks will snatch them away. Again, the male does most of the hunting. Uh, because he is uh, smaller and more agile. These eaglets will eat as much as they can in one feeding and they'll store food in their crop, which is an organ located near the base of their neck. And when it's full, it looks like a golf ball. Uh, so again, but the older one tends to have the advantage and some of the younger ones won't make it because of that. Baby eaglets, again, are totally helpless when they come here. Um, but they do grow rapidly. And uh, so by nine to 10 weeks old, they are almost uh, full size. At about two weeks though, they can hold their heads up easily for feeding and then they can thermoregulate, which means that they have the ability to maintain a constant body temperature. So that helps keep them more protected in colder climates. Uh, they don't have it at birth, so the parents have to really keep them warm. Uh, at about three weeks, they're about a foot high, and their feet and beaks are very nearly adult size. Uh, at, three, at three to four weeks, they're covered in a secondary coat of gray down. But at four to six weeks, they can stand up and tear their own food. And at that same time, they start losing that down, and black juvenile feathers will begin to grow in. 
even though downy feathers are excellent insulators, they're useless. They must be replaced with feathers before an eaglet can take its first flight, which would be between 10 and 14 weeks after hatching. Uh, again, uh, at about eight weeks, the appetites of the eaglets is at its greatest, so the parents have to hunt almost continuously to feed them. Uh, and then the eaglets, they start stretching, they'll stand up, they'll stand on the edge of the nest, flap their wings in response to the gusts of wind and hover for short periods over the nest and that gets them a little stronger. At about nine to 10 weeks, they start what we call branching, uh, which is, uh, sorry, I got behind on it. Um, sorry, that's, so that's when they don't soil the nest. So they'll begin branching. So see, you see them up here on the, on the branches. So they'll just get a little ways from the nest, but they can still get down to the nest. Uh, and they're thinking about flying, but they're not quite ready yet. Um, so this is a, this one, there, of this pair, there were, there was just two, two eaglets and one of them was a lot braver than the other and would go a little higher when it was branching. The other one would, would stay pretty close to the nest. Um, here again, you can see the adult, they're looking up in the sky, waiting for dad to bring some food. Again, here, they, here you see the one branching, you see almost pretty much the full size now, except again, the wings won't be quite as strong. This is a more coastal nest. I just wanted to show you that for an example and see how even though that eaglet is almost full size, the parent is still stripping up the fish to help feed it. Again, here's a different coloration of one of the eaglets. There you see this one's more dark. And here that's getting getting those wings spread out, getting ready to fly. See how it's hovering a little bit, trying to get a little lift there, but not yet ready to go off. And here they both are still branching. This will be in about June, so you know they're full size. And then on June, July 17th, which is about the time from 4th of July to mid-July when they'll fledge, and fledge means they're leaving the nest. So you see this one's dark with some white modeling. Again, there they are. The one on the branch was less brave and this other one was always like trying to flap his wings. And that's when the danger of if they lose flight, they could plummet, but he didn't, he managed it. So there they are together. And they will do these kind of, uh, they'll practice a the cartwheel, not as a mating ritual, but just because they're juveniles and they wanna play and learn things, so, okay. And how in the world is a young eaglet banded? Because we only band the eaglets. Uh, move over Spider-Man, the bi biologist will climb up to the nest when the chick is five to six weeks old. Uh, it's big enough, its legs are big enough that the, it won't, their legs won't grow anymore. And you say, well, what about the adults? How come they're not you know, flying at the biologist? Because in the bird, bird's view, that's a pretty darn big bird. So they're not gonna go after it, but they will sit next by you know, on a branch nearby and like kind of make all kinds of noises and keep a watch out. So the biologist will, will put the, put the eaglet in a, in a canvas bag and lower it down. And the other scientists will be waiting on the ground and uh, down there they will measure, weigh and, and give the chicks two leg bands. The right leg gets a silver band with a unique national bird banding number. Uh, that's the federal band, uh, almost impossible to read the federal band, even with a good scope. The, the, the left leg gets a band with very large letters, um, uh, that is the state band. Um, this is a Massachusetts band a friend of mine got, uh, and was able to see the numbers there. Uh, Connecticut uses black bands. New York uses, uh, blue and Massachusetts uses gold. Uh, as you can see, the letters on our band is pretty large. So if you had a good lens or good uh, binoculars, you maybe could read them. And then if you did, the reason we band them, it gives us info on how successful our birds are and where they disperse to. Only chicks are banded, not adults. Uh, and it's the only way to age a bird once it has reached adulthood. Uh, again, my friend Cheryl was able to get this bird and with Photoshop, she was able to zoom in on that band and figure out that it was banded in Michigan in 2017 and came all the way here, which is kind of unusual for bald eagles. So if you do get a bird with a band, uh, no matter whether it's an eagle or other bird of prey, you can turn it in uh, and uh, get, this, uh, get this certificate.
So again, these are commonly seen bands around our area. So I just want to tell you the story of these eagles. Proof that families come in all shapes, sizes, and species, three eagles, two dads and a mom, have been raising their own eaglets over the last few, few years near the Mississippi River and the Upper Mississippi River Refuge. They do have a webcam there, the Upper Mississippi River Refuge. All three birds, a uh, star on the left is a female. Again, you can see how she's much larger. Uh, Valor one and Valor two, uh, Valor one is the right and he deserted the nest, uh, but they're all right now helping incubate and raise the young. This is called polyandry, where a female makes more than one male and both males help care for the nest. Um, so um, Valor One left right when she had the eggs and she had no one to support her. So Valor Two came in and helped out and then Valor One came back. So now they're all at the nest. So it's quite interesting to watch. Um, while not heard, unheard of, such trios have been documented a few times in Alaska in 1977, in Minnesota in 83, and California in 1992. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. So how can I observe these remarkable eagles? Well, we're lucky here in, in Connecticut to have a lot of eagles flying around. And uh, if you go to waterways, I mean, they're, they're on the, there's nests on the Hustonic River, there's nests on the Farmington River, lots of nests in the river reservoirs, but that doesn't mean that those birds are going to stay in the reservoirs. They really have better chances of fishing in, you know, shallower waterways, so they'll go along streams and creeks and rivers. Uh, but if you see a bunch of crows uh, following a bird of prey, well, first of all, they do that. It's called mobbing. And uh, a lot of smaller birds will chase larger birds to point out that there's a predator in the area, but always also just to annoy them because the bird of prey can't turn around all of a sudden and snatch them. So oftentimes you'll see like this, a crow sitting up there just making all kinds of racket and the eagle just sitting there like, oh, I'll just wait till you shut up, you know? So if you see a bunch of, if you see like a big tree and there's a bunch of crows all around it, there might likely be an owl in that tree. But a lot of times, when, when you hear a lot of ruckus by birds, uh, quite often there will be a bird of prey around. Again, here you can see it following it, you know, just kind of annoying it. So it does point out, again, there's a predator in the area. Uh, the uh, crow does have a sound block, be okay, and he'll do it balk, 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 and that's given very quickly. And that's usually when there's an eagle or a bird of prey around. So then this is a, one of the almost full grown eaglets saying, give me more food. <laughs> so anyway, uh, anyway, long may they soar. I'm gonna get out of here and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, let me get back to Zoom. Uh, and let's see if we had any questions in chat. Uh, nope. And so why don't we, everybody can unmute or, uh, Erica, can you unmute, unmute everybody? Sure. See if anybody has any questions. You all are very quiet. <laughs> uh, I, ha I live in Lakeville. And yeah. I have an eagle's nest on my property. We have about 11 acres, awesome. uh, which are just wild. And that's where the nest is. We mm -hmm. had a nest last year, thanks to a neighbor who uh, highlighted the fact that I had it. Right. Uh, they did have... Uh, I assume two, uh, two chicks, and we saw them leave. They they were quite large. I don't know where they went, mm -hmm. and that, so that's one question: Where did they go? Uh, these babies, right. and they're back this year. The nest is huge. Right. It, it does have a canopy above it in a tall pine, and as you said, they are masterful nest builders. I'm just I'm so impressed. It's fun to watch the whole process. So what happened is, uh, And last year uh, through Audubon, I did call uh, Connecticut uh, Wildlife to have them come and look at the, the nest and, and possibly ban the eagles uh, through Audubon. And they said they don't do that service anymore because it they don't have the funding. Right. Yeah. The, the issue is like, you know, so, last year we had in 
2020, we had 72 active territories. So that's 72 nests, you know, and there's yeah. essentially one guy that's like the, the eagle biologist, but he yeah. also does other jobs. So the, it's more, it's more, the funding is more in personnel. You know, there's not enough people to keep up, but they still would like you to, you know, get on the website and give reports of, oh, okay, so here in Lakeville, but you wouldn't say the exact spot because we don't actually like people. Well, I mean, you could say it's a DEP, but, um, you know, we actually had two eagles fledge this year, you know, so they'd like to know that because that way they can say, okay, there's a nest in, in Lakeville right. and it had two successful, you know, fledglings. Uh, machine, you know? So that's great information to, to give them. Uh, as well so yeah so unfortunately and that's true with a lot of our wildlife species like once you know right now when the bears start coming out and then we start getting nuisance calls and all kinds of stuff a lot of the biologists are spending all their time you know having to run around you know with all these calls rather than uh you know having to do a lot of the other things that would i'm not on the lake but i they fly in the direction of the lake so that's i assume right. that's where they go right. Yeah, so, uh, so where they go is the young ones will stay around the nest with the parents until probably August or early September. Right. And then they all just take off. And like, um, like I said, they don't migrate very far. So they're going to be, you're probably going to see those juveniles still flying around, uh, you know, within like a probably a 20 mile radius. So they're, those birds are most likely going to become our birds, you know what I mean? And they'll, once they get um, mature age, they'll, they'll, make their own nests and uh, usually the nests are at least two miles away from each other and they'll start breeding themselves. So uh, most of the most of our eaglets will kind of stay around. Uh, but some might go to Massachusetts or you know um, other states nearby but generally they don't you know they're not going to wind up in Texas. We need the road sign. Uh. Anyway good good to know. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Well, like I said, it's spectacular that these birds have come back all, all across the country. And uh, my thing is, let's do all we can to keep our waterways and our environment healthy. Uh, I used to be a sports writer. And uh, when I covered the 82, I mean, I'm sorry, the 84 Olympics in LA, back then the smog was so bad in LA and oh. New York City that in the 82, 84 Olympics, they would have to post some events because the air quality was so bad and then that fall and at the U.S. Open tennis in New York I, I could hardly see the skyline of New York from Queens and now you know it, it has come a long way because of different protections uh, that has cleaned up our environment and I don't have kids but if I did have kids I would you know do everything I can to keep and I'm sure if you're here listening to this talk you guys think the same but we really need to do all we can to keep everything cleaned up uh, and uh, protected. So I thank you for having an interest in wildlife. And I think I'm going to talk to you about beavers, which are a keystone species, which means uh, they have a great impact on uh, the health of our waterways and uh, everything. So I look forward to talking to you then. And now there's still plenty of time to get out in that good weather and get some of that vitamin C that we haven't had this year. So Thank you very much. And, uh, I'll see Thank you, you Jenny. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thanks for being Thank part so of much. our show. I'm going to take care. Stay Thank well. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay,